This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Short Works by Gustave Flaubert The Legend of St. Julian the Hospitaller Chapter 1 The Curse Julian's father and mother dwelt in a castle built on the slope of a hill in the heart of the woods. The towers at its four corners had pointed roofs covered with leaden tiles, and the foundation rested upon solid rocks, which descended abruptly to the bottom of the moat. In the courtyard, the stone flagging was as immaculate as the floor of a church. Long rain-spouts, representing dragons with yawning jaws, directed the water towards the cistern, and on each window-sill of the castle a basil or a heliotrope bush bloomed in painted flower-pots. A second enclosure, surrounded by a fence, comprised a fruit orchard, a garden decorated with figures wrought in bright-hued flowers, an arbour with several bowers, and a mall for the diversion of the pages. On the other side were the kennel, the stables, the bakery, the wine-press, and the barns. Around these spread a pasture, also enclosed by a strong hedge. Peace had reigned so long that the portcullis was never lowered. The moats were filled with water, swallows built their nests in the cracks of the battlements, and as soon as the sun shone too strongly, the archer, who all day long paced to and fro on the curtain, withdrew to the watchtower and slept soundly. Inside the castle the locks on the doors shone brightly, Costly tapestries hung in the apartments to keep out the cold. The closets overflowed with linen, the cellar was filled with casks of wine, and the oak chests fairly groaned under the weight of money-bags. In the armoury could be seen, between banners and the heads of wild beasts, weapons of all nations and of all ages. From the slings of the Amalekites, and the javelins of the Garamantes, to the broadswords of the Saracens, and the coats of mail of the Normans. The largest spit in the kitchen could hold an ox. The chapel was as gorgeous as a king's oratory. There was even a Roman bath in a secluded part of the castle, though the good lord of the manor refrained from using it, as he deemed it a heathenish practice. Wrapped always in a cape made of fox-skins, he wandered about the castle, rendered justice among his vassals, and settled his neighbours' quarrels. In the winter he gazed dreamily at the falling snow, or had stories read aloud to him. But as soon as the fine weather returned he would mount his mule and sally forth into the country roads, edged with ripening wheat, to talk with the peasants, to whom he distributed advice. After a number of adventures, he took unto himself a wife of high lineage. She was pale and serious, and a trifle haughty. The horns of her headdress touched the top of the doors, and the hem of her gown trailed far behind. She conducted her household like a cloister, Every morning she distributed work to the maids, supervised the making of preserves and unguents, and afterwards passed her time in spinning or embroidering altar-cloths. In response to her fervent prayers, God granted her a son. Then there was great rejoicing, and they gave a feast which lasted three days and four nights, with illuminations and soft music. Chickens as large as sheep, and the rarest spices were served. For the entertainment of the guests, a dwarf crept out of a pie, and when the bowls were too few, for the crowd swelled continuously, the wine was drunk from helmets and hunting horns. The young mother did not appear at the feast. She was quietly resting in bed, 
one night she awoke and beheld in a moonbeam that crept through the window something that looked like a moving shadow. It was an old man, clad in sackcloth, who resembled a hermit. A rosary dangled at his side, and he carried a beggar's sack on his shoulder. He approached the foot of the bed, and without opening his lips, said, Rejoice, O mother, thy son shall be a saint. She would have cried out, but the old man, gliding along the moonbeam, rose through the air and disappeared. The songs of the banqueters grew louder, she could hear angels' voices, and her head sank back on the pillow, which was surmounted by the bone of a martyr, framed in precious stones. The following day, the servants, upon being questioned, declared to a man that they had seen no hermit. Then, whether dream or fact, this must certainly have been a communication from heaven. But she took care not to speak of it, lest she should be accused of presumption. The guests departed at daybreak, and Julian's father stood at the castle gate, where he had just bidden farewell to the last one, when a beggar suddenly emerged from the mist and confronted him. He was a gypsy, for he had a braided beard and wore silver bracelets on each arm. His eyes burned, and, in an inspired way, he muttered some disconnected words. Ah, ah, thy son! Great bloodshed! Great glory! Happy always! An emperor's family! Then he stooped to pick up the arms thrown to him, and disappeared in the tall grass. The lord of the manor looked up and down the road, and called as loudly as he could, but no one answered him. The wind only howled, and the morning mists were fast dissolving. He attributed his vision to a dullness of the brain, resulting from too much sleep. If I should speak of it, quoth he, people would laugh at me. Still the glory that was to be his son's dazzled him, albeit the meaning of the prophecy was not clear to him, and he even doubted that he had heard it. The parents kept their secret from each other but both cherished the child with equal devotion, and as they considered him marked by God, they had great regard for his person. His cradle was lined with the softest feathers, and a lamp representing a dove burned continually over it. Three nurses rocked him night and day, and with his pink cheeks and blue eyes, brocaded cloak and embroidered cap, he looked like a little Jesus. He cut all his teeth without even a whimper. When he was seven years old, his mother taught him to sing, and his father lifted him upon a tall horse to inspire him with courage. The child smiled with delight, and soon became familiar with everything pertaining to charges. An old and very learned monk taught him the gospel, the Arabic numerals, the Latin letters, and the art of painting delicate designs on vellum. They worked in the top of a tower, away from all noise and disturbance. When the lesson was over, they would go down into the garden and study the flowers. Sometimes a herd of cattle passed through the valley below, in charge of a man in oriental dress. The lord of the manor, recognizing him as a merchant, would dispatch a servant after him. The stranger, becoming confident, would stop on his way, and after being ushered into the castle hall, would display pieces of velvet and silk, trinkets and strange objects whose use was unknown in those parts. Then, in due time, he would take leave, without having been molested, and with a handsome profit. At other times a band of pilgrims would knock at the door, their wet garments would be hung in front of the hearth, and after they had been refreshed by food, they would relate their travels and discuss the uncertainty of vessels on the high seas, their long journeys across burning sands, the ferocity of the infidels, the caves of Syria, the manger, and the holy sepulchre. They made presents to the young heir of beautiful shells which they carried in their cloaks.' 
the lord of the manor very often feasted his brothers at arms, and over the wine the old warriors would talk of battles and attacks, of war machines, and of the frightful wounds they'd received, so that Julian, who was a listener, would scream with excitement. Then his father felt convinced that some day he would be a conqueror. But in the evening, after the Angelus, when he passed through the crowd of beggars who clustered about the church door, he distributed his arms with so much modesty and nobility that his mother fully expected to see him become an archbishop in time. His seat in the chapel was next to his parents, and no matter how long the services lasted, he remained kneeling on his prie-dieu, with folded hands and his velvet cap lying close beside him on the floor. One day, during Mass, he raised his head and beheld a little white mouse crawling out of a hole in the wall. It scrambled to the first altar step, and then, after a few gambles, ran back in the same direction. On the following Sunday, the idea of seeing the mouse again worried him. It returned and every Sunday after that he watched for it, and it annoyed him so much that he grew to hate it, and resolved to do away with it. So, having closed the door and strewn some crumbs on the steps of the altar, he placed himself in front of the hole with a stick. After a long while a pink snout appeared, and the whole mouse crept out. He struck it lightly with his stick, and stood stunned at the sight of the little lifeless body. A drop of blood stained the floor. He wiped it away hastily with his sleeve, and, picking up the mouse, threw it away, without saying a word about it to anyone. All sorts of birds pecked at the seeds in the garden. He put some peas in a hollow reed, and when he heard birds chirping in a tree, he would approach cautiously, lift the tube and swell his cheeks. Then, when the little creatures dropped about him in multitudes, he could not refrain from laughing and being delighted with his own cleverness. One morning, as he was returning by way of the curtain, he beheld a fat pigeon sunning itself on the top of the wall. He paused to gaze at it. Where he stood, the rampart was cracked, and a piece of stone was near at hand. He gave his arm a jerk, and the well-aimed missile struck the bird squarely, sending it straight into the moat below. He sprang after it, unmindful of the brambles, and ferreted around the bushes with the litheness of a young dog. The pigeon hung with broken wings in the branches of a privet tree. The persistence of its life irritated the boy. He began to strangle it, and its convulsions made his heart beat quicker, and filled him with a wild, tumultuous voluptuousness, the last throb of its heart making him feel like fainting. At supper that night, his father declared that at his age a boy should begin to hunt, and he arose and brought forth an old writing book, which contained, in questions and answers, everything pertaining to the pastime. In it a master showed a supposed pupil how to train dogs and falcons, lay traps, recognize a stag by its fumets, and a fox or a wolf by its footprints. He also taught the best way of discovering their tracks, how to start them, where their refuges are usually to be found, what winds are the most favorable, and further enumerated the various cries and the rules of the quarry. When Julian was able to recite all these things by heart, his father made up a pack of hounds for him. There were twenty-four greyhounds of Barbary, speedier than gazelles, but liable to get out of temper. Seventeen couples of Breton dogs, great barkers with broad chests and russet coats flecked with white. For wild boar hunting and perilous doublings, there were forty boar hounds as hairy as bears. The red mastiffs of Tartary, almost as large as donkeys, with broad backs and straight legs, were destined for the pursuit of the wild bull, 
the black coats of the spaniels shone like satin. The barking of the setters equaled that of the beagles. In a special enclosure were eight growling bloodhounds that tugged at their chains and rolled their eyes, and these dogs leaped at men's throats and were not afraid even of lions. All ate wheat bread, drank from marble troughs, and had high-sounding names. Perhaps the falconry surpassed the pack, for the master of the castle, by paying great sums of money, had secured Caucasian hawks, Babylonian sakers, German gerfalcons, and pilgrim falcons captured on the cliffs, edging the cold seas in distant lands. They were housed in a thatched shed, and were chained to the perch in the order of size. In front of them was a little grass plot, where, from time to time, they were allowed to disport themselves. Bagnets, baits, traps, and all sorts of snares were manufactured. Often they would take out pointers, who would set almost immediately. Then the whippers in, advancing step by step, would cautiously spread a huge net over their motionless bodies. At the command, the dogs would bark and arouse the quails, and the ladies of the neighbourhood, with their husbands, children, and handmaids, would fall upon them and capture them with ease. At other times they used to drum to start hares, and frequently foxes fell into the ditches prepared for them, while wolves caught their paws in the traps. But Julian scorned these convenient contrivances. He preferred to hunt away from the crowd, alone with his steed and his falcon. It was almost always a large, snow-white, Scythian bird. His leather hood was ornamented with a plume, and on his blue feet were bells, and he perched firmly on his master's arm while they galloped across the plains. Then Julian would suddenly untie his tether and let him fly, and the bold bird would dart through the air like an arrow. One might perceive two spots circle around, unite, and then disappear in the blue heights. Presently the falcon would return with a mutilated bird, and perch again on his master's gauntlet with trembling wings. Julian loved to sound his trumpet, and follow his dogs over hills and streams, into the woods, and when the stag began to moan under their teeth, he would kill it deftly, and delight in the fury of the brutes, which would devour the pieces spread out on the warm hide. On foggy days he would hide in the marshes to watch for wild geese, otters, and wild ducks. At daybreak three equerries waited for him at the foot of the steps, and though the old monk leaned out of the dormer window and made signs to him to return, Julian would not look around. He heeded neither the broiling sun, the rain, nor the storm. He drank spring water and ate wild berries, and when he was tired he lay down under a tree, and he would come home at night covered with earth and blood, with thistles in his hair and smelling of wild beasts. He grew to be like them, and when his mother kissed him he responded coldly to her caress and seemed to be thinking of deep and serious things. He killed bears with a knife, bulls with a hatchet, and wild boars with a spear, and once, with nothing but a stick, he defended himself against some wolves which were gnawing corpses at the foot of a gibbet. One winter morning he set out before daybreak, with a bow slung across his shoulder and a quiver of arrows attached to the pommel of his saddle. The hooves of his steed beat the ground with regularity, and his two beagles trotted close behind. The wind was blowing hard, and icicles clung to his cloak. A part of the horizon cleared, and he beheld some rabbits playing around their burrows. In an instant the two dogs were upon them, and seizing as many as they could, they broke their backs in the twinkling of an eye. Soon he came to a forest. A woodcock, paralyzed by the cold, perched on a branch, with its head hidden under its wing. Julian, 
with a lunge of his sword, cut off its feet, and without stopping to pick it up, rode away. Three hours later, he found himself on the top of a mountain so high that the sky seemed almost black. In front of him, a long flat rock hung over a precipice, and at the end two wild goats stood gazing down into the abyss. As he had no arrows, for he had left his steed behind, he thought he would climb down to where they stood, and with bare feet and bent back he at last reached the first goat, and thrust his dagger below its ribs. But the second animal, in its terror, leaped into the precipice. Julian threw himself forward to strike it, but his right foot slipped and he fell, face downward and with outstretched arms, over the body of the first goat. After he returned to the plains, he followed a stream bordered by willows. From time to time, some cranes, flying low, passed over his head. He killed them with his whip, never missing a bird. He beheld in the distance the gleam of a lake which appeared to be of lead, and in the middle of it was an animal he had never seen before, a beaver with a black muzzle. Notwithstanding the distance that separated them, an arrow ended its life, and Julian only regretted that he was not able to carry the skin home with him. Then he entered an avenue of tall trees, the tops of which formed a triumphal arch to the entrance of a forest. A deer sprang out of a thicket, and a badger crawled out of its hole. A stag appeared in the road, and a peacock spread its fan-shaped tail in the grass. And after he had slain them all, other deer, other stags, other badgers, other peacocks and jays, blackbirds, foxes, porcupines, polecats and lynxes appeared. In fact, a host of beasts that grew more and more numerous with every step he took. Trembling, and with a look of appeal in their eyes, they gathered around Julian. But he did not stop slaying them, and so intent was he on stretching his bow, drawing his sword, and whipping out his knife, that he had little thought for aught else. He knew that he was hunting in some country since an indefinite time, through the very fact of his existence, as everything seemed to occur with the ease one experiences in dreams. But presently, an extraordinary sight made him pause. He beheld a valley, shaped like a circus, and filled with stags, which, huddled together, were warming one another with the vapour of their breaths that mingled with the early mist. For a few minutes he almost choked with pleasure at the prospect of so great a carnage. Then he sprang from his horse, rolled up his sleeves, and began to aim. When the first arrow whizzed through the air, the stags turned their heads simultaneously. They huddled closer, uttered plaintive cries, and a great agitation seized the whole herd. The edge of the valley was too high to admit of flight, and the animals ran around the enclosure in their efforts to escape. Julian aimed, stretched his bow, and his arrows fell as fast and thick as raindrops in a shower. Maddened with terror, the stags fought and reared and climbed on top of one another. Their antlers and bodies formed a moving mountain which tumbled to pieces whenever it displaced itself. Finally the last one expired. Their bodies lay stretched out on the sand, with foam gushing from the nostrils and the bowels protruding. The heaving of their bellies grew less and less noticeable, and presently all was still. Night came, and behind the trees, through the branches, the sky appeared like a sheet of blood. Julian leaned against a tree, and gazed with dilated eyes at the enormous slaughter. He was now unable to comprehend how he had accomplished it. On the opposite side of the valley, he suddenly beheld a large stag, with a doe and their fawn. The buck was black and of enormous size. He had a white beard and carried sixteen antlers. His mate was the colour of dead leaves, and she browsed upon the grass, 
while the fawn, clinging to her udder, followed her step by step. Again the bow was stretched, and instantly the fawn dropped dead. And seeing this, its mother raised her head and uttered a poignant, almost human wail of agony. Exasperated, Julian thrust his knife into her chest and felled her to the ground. The great stag had watched everything, and suddenly he sprang forward. Julian aimed his last arrow at the beast. It struck him between his antlers and stuck there. The stag did not appear to notice it. Leaping over the bodies, he was coming nearer and nearer, with the intention, Julian thought, of charging at him and ripping him open, and he recoiled with inexpressible horror. But presently the huge animal halted, and, with eyes of flame, and the solemn air of a patriarch and a judge, repeated thrice, while a bell tolled in the distance, Accursed! 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 Some day, ferocious soul, thou wilt murder thy father and thy mother. Then he sank to his knees, gently closed his lids, and expired. At first Julian was stunned, and then a sudden lassitude and an immense sadness came over him. Holding his head between his hands, he wept for a long time. His steed had wandered away. His dogs had forsaken him. The solitude seemed to threaten him with unknown perils. Impelled by a sense of sickening terror, he ran across the fields, and choosing a path at random, found himself almost immediately at the gates of the castle. That night he could not rest, for, by the flickering light of the hanging lamp, he beheld again the huge black stag. He fought against the obsession of the prediction, and kept repeating, No, no, I cannot slay them. And then he thought, Still, supposing I desired to, and he feared that the devil might inspire him with this desire. During three months, his distracted mother prayed at his bedside, and his father paced the halls of the castle in anguish. He consulted the most celebrated physicians, who prescribed quantities of medicine. Julian's illness, they declared, was due to some injurious wind, or to amorous desire. But in reply to their questions, the young man only shook his head. After a time, his strength returned, and he was able to walk in the courtyard supported by his father and the old monk. But after he had completely recovered, he refused to hunt. His father, hoping to please him, presented him with a large Saracen sabre. It was placed on a panoply that hung on a pillar, and a ladder was required to reach it. Julian climbed up to it one day, but the heavy weapon slipped from his grasp, and in falling grazed his father and tore his cloak. Julian, believing he'd killed him, fell in a swoon. After that he carefully avoided weapons. The sight of a naked sword made him grow pale, and this weakness caused great distress to his family. In the end, the old monk ordered him, in the name of God and of his forefathers, once more to indulge in the sports of a nobleman. The equerries diverted themselves every day with javelins, and Julian soon excelled in the practice. He was able to send a javelin into bottles, to break the teeth of the weathercocks on the castle, and to strike doornails at a distance of one hundred feet. One summer evening, at the hour when dusk renders objects indistinct, he was in the arbour, in the garden, and thought he saw two white wings in the background, hovering around the espalier. Not for a moment did he doubt that it was a stork, and so he threw his javelin at it. A heart-rending scream pierced the air. He had struck his mother, whose cap and long streams remained nailed to the wall. Julian fled from home 
and never returned. End of chapter 1「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Three Short Works by Gustave Flaubert The Legend of St. Julian the Hospitaller Chapter 2 The Crime he joined a horde of adventurers who were passing through the place. He learned what it was to suffer hunger, thirst, sickness, and filth. He grew accustomed to the din of battles and to the sight of dying men. The wind tanned his skin. His limbs became hardened through contact with armor. And as he was very strong and brave, temperate and of good counsel, he easily obtained command of a company. At the outset of a battle, he would electrify his soldiers by a motion of his sword. He would climb the walls of a citadel with a knotted rope at night, rocked by a storm, while sparks of fire clung to his cuirass, and molten lead and boiling tar poured from the battlements. Often a stone would break his shield, Bridges crowded with men gave way under him. Once, by turning his mace, he rid himself of fourteen horsemen. He defeated all those who came forward to fight him on the field of honour, and more than a score of times it was believed that he had been killed. However, thanks to divine protection, he always escaped, for he shielded orphans, widows, and aged men. When he caught sight of one of the latter walking ahead of him, he would call to him to show his face, as if he feared that he might kill him by mistake. All sorts of intrepid men gathered under his leadership, fugitive slaves, peasant rebels, and penniless bastards. He then organized an army which increased so much that he became famous and was in great demand. He succoured in turn the Dauphin of France, the King of England, the Templars of Jerusalem, the General of the Paths, the Negus of Abyssinia, and the Emperor of Calicut. He fought against Scandinavians covered with fish scales, against Negroes mounted on red asses and armed with shields made of hippopotamus hide, against gold-coloured Indians who wielded great shining swords above their heads. He conquered the troglodytes and the cannibals. He travelled through regions so torrid that the heat of the sun would set fire to the hair on one's head. He journeyed through countries so glacial that one's arms would fall from the body. And he passed through places where the fogs were so dense that it seemed like being surrounded by phantoms. Republics in trouble consulted him. When he conferred with ambassadors, he always obtained unexpected concessions. Also, if a monarch behaved badly, he would arrive on the scene and rebuke him. He freed nations. He rescued queens sequestered in towers. It was he, and no other, that killed the serpent of Milan and the dragon of Oberbierbach. Now the emperor of Occitania having triumphed over the Spanish Mussulmans, had taken the sister of the Caliph of Cordova as a concubine, and had had one daughter by her, whom he brought up in the teachings of Christ. But the Caliph, feigning that he wished to become converted, made him a visit, and brought with him a numerous escort. He slaughtered the entire garrison, and threw the emperor into a dungeon, and treated him with great cruelty in order to obtain possession of his treasures. Julian went to his assistance, destroyed the army of infidels, laid siege to the city, slew the caliph, chopped off his head, and threw it over the fortifications like a cannonball. As a reward for so great a service, the emperor presented him with a large sum of money in baskets 
but Julian declined it. Then the emperor, thinking that the amount was not sufficiently large, offered him three quarters of his fortune, and on meeting a second refusal, proposed to share his kingdom with his benefactor. But Julian only thanked him for it, and the emperor felt like weeping with vexation at not being able to show his gratitude, when he suddenly tapped his forehead and whispered a few words in the ear of one of his courtiers. The tapestry curtains parted, and a young girl appeared. Her large black eyes shone like two soft lights. A charming smile parted her lips. Her curls were caught in the jewels of her half-opened bodice, and the grace of her youthful body could be divined under the transparency of her tunic. She was small and quite plump, but her waist was slender. Julian was absolutely dazzled, all the more since he had always led a chaste life. So he married the emperor's daughter, and received at the same time a castle she had inherited from her mother. And when the rejoicings were over, he departed with his bride, after many courtesies had been exchanged on both sides. The castle was of Moorish design, in white marble, erected on a promontory, and surrounded by orange trees. Terraces of flowers extended to the shell-strewn shores of a beautiful bay. Behind the castle spread a fan-shaped forest. The sky was always blue, and the trees were swayed in turn by the ocean breeze and by the winds that blew from the mountains that closed the horizon. Light entered the apartments through the incrustations of the walls. High, reed-like columns supported the ceiling of the cupolas, decorated in imitation of stalactites. Fountains played in the spacious halls. The courts were inlaid with mosaic. There were festooned partitions and a great profusion of architectural fancies, and everywhere reigned a silence so deep that the swish of a sash or the echo of a sigh could be distinctly heard. Julian now had renounced war. Surrounded by a peaceful people, he remained idle, receiving every day a throng of subjects who came and knelt before him and kissed his hands in oriental fashion. Clad in sumptuous garments, he would gaze out of the window and think of his past exploits, and wish that he might again run in the desert in pursuit of ostriches and gazelles, hide among the bamboos to watch for leopards, ride through forests filled with rhinoceroses, climb the most inaccessible peaks in order to have a better aim at the eagles, and fight the polar bears on the icebergs of the northern sea. Sometimes in his dreams he fancied himself like Adam in the midst of paradise, surrounded by all the beasts. By merely extending his arm he was able to kill them, or else they filed past him in pairs, by order of size, from the lions and the elephants to the ermines and the ducks, as on the day they entered Noah's ark. Hidden in the shadow of a cave, he aimed unerring arrows at them. Then came others and still others, until he awoke, wild-eyed. Princes, friends of his, invited him to their meets, but he always refused their invitations because he thought that by this kind of penance he might possibly avert the threatened misfortune. It seemed to him that the fate of his parents depended on his refusal to slaughter animals. He suffered because he could not see them, and his other desire was growing well-nigh unbearable. In order to divert his mind, his wife had dancers and jugglers come to the castle, she went abroad with him in an open litter. At other times, stretched out on the edge of a boat, they watched for hours the fish disport themselves in the water, which was as clear as the sky. Often she playfully threw flowers at him, or nestled at his feet. She played melodies on an old mandolin. Then, clasping her hands on his shoulder, she would inquire tremulously, 
what troubles thee, my dear lord? He would not reply, or else he would burst into tears. But at last, one day, he confessed his fearful dread. His wife scorned the idea and reasoned wisely with him. Probably his father and mother were dead, and even if he should ever see them again, through what chance, to what end, would he arrive at this abomination? Therefore his fears were groundless, and he should hunt again. Julian listened to her and smiled, but he could not bring himself to yield to his desire. One August evening, when they were in their bedchamber, she having just retired, and he being about to kneel in prayer, he heard the yelping of a fox and light footsteps under the window, and he thought he saw things in the dark that looked like animals. The temptation was too strong. He seized his quiver. His wife appeared astonished. "'I am obeying you,' quoth he, "'and I shall be back at sunrise.' However, she feared that some calamity would happen. But he reassured her and departed, surprised at her illogical moods. A short time afterwards, a page came to announce that two strangers desired, in the absence of the lord of the castle, to see its mistress at once. Soon a stooping old man and an aged woman entered the room. Their coarse garments were covered with dust, and each leaned on a stick. They grew bold enough to say that they brought Julian news of his parents. She leaned out of the bed to listen to them, but after glancing at each other, the old people asked her whether he ever referred to them, and if he still loved them. Oh, yes, she said. Then they exclaimed, We are his parents, and they sat themselves down, for they were very tired. But there was nothing to show the young wife that her husband was their son. They proved it by describing to her the birthmarks he had on his body. Then she jumped out of bed, called a page, and ordered that a repast be served to them. But although they were very hungry, they could scarcely eat, and she observed surreptitiously how their lean fingers trembled whenever they lifted their cups. They asked a hundred questions about their son, and she answered each one of them, but she was careful not to refer to the terrible idea that concerned them. When he failed to return, they had left their chateau, and had wandered for several years, following vague indications, but without losing hope. So much money had been spent at the tolls of the rivers and in inns to satisfy the rights of princes and the demands of highwaymen that now their purse was quite empty and they were obliged to beg. But what did it matter since they were about to clasp again their son in their arms? They lauded his happiness in having such a beautiful wife and did not tire of looking at her and kissing her. The luxuriousness of the apartment astonished them and the old man, after examining the walls, inquired why they bore the coat of arms of the Emperor of Occitania. He is my father, she replied. And he marvelled and remembered the prediction of the gypsy, while his wife meditated upon the words the hermit had spoken to her. The glory of their son was undoubtedly only the dawn of eternal splendours, and the old people remained awed, while the light from the candelabra on the table fell on them. In the heyday of youth, both had been extremely handsome. The mother had not lost her hair, and bands of snowy whiteness framed her cheeks, and the father, with his stalwart figure and strong beard, looked like a carved image. Julian's wife prevailed upon them not to wait for him. She put them in her bed and closed the curtains, and they both fell asleep. The day broke, and outdoors the little birds began to chirp. Meanwhile, Julian had left the castle grounds and walked nervously through the forest, enjoying the velvety softness of the grass and the barminess of the air. The shadow of the trees fell on the earth. Here and there, 
the moonlight flecked the glades, and Julian feared to advance because he mistook the silvery light for water and the tranquil surface of the pools for grass. A great stillness reigned everywhere, and he failed to see any of the beasts that only a moment ago were prowling around the castle. As he walked on, the woods grew thicker, and the darkness more impenetrable. Warm winds, filled with enervating perfumes, caressed him. He sank into masses of dead leaves, and after a while he leaned against an oak tree to rest and catch his breath. Suddenly a body blacker than the surrounding darkness sprang from behind a tree. It was a wild boar. Julian did not have time to stretch his bow, and he bewailed the fact as if it were some great misfortune. Presently, having left the woods, he beheld a wolf slinking along a hedge. He aimed an arrow at him. The wolf paused, turned his head, and quietly continued on his way. He trotted along, always keeping at the same distance, pausing now and then to look around, and resuming his flight as soon as an arrow was aimed in his direction. In this way, Julian traversed an apparently endless plain, then sand hills, and at last found himself on a plateau that dominated a great stretch of land. Large flat stones were interspersed among crumbling vaults, Bones and skeletons covered the ground, and here and there some mouldy crosses stood desolate. But presently shapes moved in the darkness of the tombs, and from them came panting, wild-eyed hyenas. They approached him and smelled him, grinning hideously and disclosing their gums. He whipped out his sword, but they scattered in every direction and continuing their swift, limping gallop, disappeared in a cloud of dust. Sometime afterwards, in a ravine, he encountered a wild bull, with threatening horns, pawing the sand with his hooves. Julian thrust his lance between his dewlaps, but his weapon snapped as if the beast were made of bronze. Then he closed his eyes in anticipation of his death. When he opened them again, the bull had vanished. Then his soul collapsed with shame. Some supernatural power destroyed his strength, and he set out for home through the forest. The woods were a tangle of creeping plants that he had to cut with his sword, and while he was thus engaged, a weasel slid between his feet, a panther jumped over his shoulder, and a serpent wound itself around the ash tree. Among its leaves was a monstrous jackdaw that watched Julian intently, and here and there, between the branches, appeared great fiery sparks, as if the sky were raining all its stars upon the forest. But the sparks were the eyes of wild cats, owls, squirrels, monkeys, and parrots. Julian aimed his arrows at them, but the feathered weapons lighted on the leaves of the trees and looked like white butterflies. He threw stones at them, but the missiles did not strike, and fell to the ground. Then he cursed himself and howled imprecations, and in his rage he could have struck himself. Then all the beasts he had pursued appeared, and formed a narrow circle around him. Some sat on their hindquarters, while others stood at full height and Julian remained among them, transfixed with terror and absolutely unable to move. By a supreme effort of his willpower, he took a step forward. Those that perched in the trees opened their wings, those that trod the earth moved their limbs, and all accompanied him. The hyenas strode in front of him, the wolf and the wild boar brought up the rear, on his right, the bull swung its head, and on his left, the serpent crawled through the grass, while the panther, arching its back, advanced with velvety footfalls and long strides. Julian walked as slowly as possible, so as not to irritate them, while in the depths of bushes he could distinguish porcupines, foxes, vipers, jackals, and bears. He began to run, 
the brutes followed him. The serpent hissed, the malodorous beasts frothed at the mouth. The wild boar rubbed his tusks against his heels, and the wolf scratched the palms of his hands with the hairs of his snout. The monkeys pinched him and made faces, the weasel tolled over his feet. A bear knocked his cap off with its huge paw, and the panther disdainfully dropped an arrow it was about to put in its mouth. Irony seemed to incite their sly actions. As they watched him out of the corners of their eyes, they seemed to meditate a plan of revenge, and Julian, who was deafened by the buzzing of the insects, bruised by the wings and tails of the birds, choked by the stench of animal breaths, walked with outstretched arms and closed lids like a blind man, without even the strength to beg for mercy. The crowing of a cock vibrated in the air. Other cocks responded. It was day, and Julian recognized the top of his palace rising above the orange trees. Then, on the edge of a field, he beheld some red partridges fluttering around a stubble field. He unfastened his cloak and threw it over them like a net. When he lifted it, he found only a bird that had been dead a long time and was decaying. This disappointment irritated him more than all the others. The thirst for carnage stirred afresh within him. Animals failing him, he desired to slaughter men. He climbed the three terraces and opened the door with a blow of his fist. But at the foot of the staircase, the memory of his beloved wife softened his heart. No doubt she was asleep, and he would go up and surprise her. Having removed his sandals, he unlocked the door softly and entered. The stained windows dimmed the pale light of dawn. Julian stumbled over some garments lying on the floor, and a little further on he knocked against a table covered with dishes. She must have eaten, he thought, so he advanced cautiously towards the bed, which was concealed by the darkness in the back of the room. When he reached the edge, he leaned over the pillow, where the two heads were resting close together and stooped to kiss his wife. His mouth encountered a man's beard. He fell back, thinking he'd become crazed. Then he approached the bed again, and his searching fingers discovered some hair which seemed to be very long. In order to convince himself that he was mistaken, he once more passed his hand slowly over the pillow. But this time he was sure that it was a beard, and that a man was there, a man lying beside his wife. Flying into an ungovernable passion, he sprang upon them with his drawn dagger, foaming, stamping, and howling like a wild beast. After a while, he stopped. The corpses, pierced through the heart, had not even moved. He listened attentively to the two death-rattles. They were almost alike, and as they grew fainter, another voice coming from far away seemed to continue them. Uncertain at first, this plaintive voice came nearer and nearer, grew louder and louder, and presently he recognized, with a feeling of abject terror, the bellowing of the great black stag. And as he turned, he thought he saw the specter of his wife, standing at the threshold with a light in her hand. The sound of the murder had aroused her. In one glance, she understood what had happened and fled in horror, letting the candle drop from her hand. Julian picked it up. His father and mother lay before him, stretched on their backs, with gaping wounds in their breasts, and their faces the expression of which was full of tender dignity, seemed to hide what might be an eternal secret. Splashes and blotches of blood were on their white skin, on the bedclothes, on the floor, and on an ivory Christ which hung in the alcove. The scarlet reflection of the stained window, which just then was struck by the sun, lighted up the bloody spots and appeared to scatter them around the whole room. Julian walked towards the corpses 
repeating to himself and trying to believe that he was mistaken, that it was not possible, that there are often inexplicable likenesses. At last he bent over to look closely at the old man, and he saw, between the half-closed lids, a dead pupil that scorched him like fire. Then he went over to the other side of the bed where the other corpse lay, but the face was partly hidden by bands of white hair. Julian slipped his finger beneath them and raised the head, holding it at arm's length to study its features, while, with his other hand, he lifted the torch. Drops of blood oozed from the mattress and fell one by one upon the floor. At the close of the day, he appeared before his wife, and in a changed voice commanded her first not to answer him, not to approach him, not even to look at him, and to obey, under the penalty of eternal damnation, every one of his orders, which were irrevocable. The funeral was to be held in accordance with the written instructions he had left on a chair in the death chamber. He left her his castle, his vassals, all his worldly goods, without keeping even his clothes or his sandals, which would be found at the top of the stairs. She had obeyed the will of God in bringing about his crime, and accordingly she must pray for his soul, since henceforth he should cease to exist. The dead were buried sumptuously in the chapel of a monastery, which it took three days to reach from the castle. A monk wearing a hood that covered his head followed the procession alone, for nobody dared to speak to him. And during the mass he lay flat on the floor with his face downward and his arms stretched out at his sides. After the burial he was seen to take to the road leading into the mountains. He looked back several times and finally passed out of sight. End of chapter 2「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Short Works by Gustave Flaubert The Legend of St. Julian the Hospitaller Chapter 3 The Reparation He left the country and begged his daily bread on his way. He stretched out his hand to the horsemen he met in the roads, and humbly approached the harvesters in the fields, or else remained motionless in front of the gates of castles, and his face was so sad that he was never turned away. Obeying a spirit of humility, he related his history to all men, and they would flee from him and cross themselves. In villages through which he'd passed before, the good people bolted the doors, threatened him, and threw stones at him as soon as they recognized him. The more charitable ones placed a bowl on the window sill and closed the shutters in order to avoid seeing him. Repelled and shunned by everyone, he avoided his fellow men and nourished himself with roots and plants, stray fruits and shells which he gathered along the shores. Often, at the bend of a hill, he could perceive a mass of crowded roofs, stone spires, bridges, towers, and narrow streets, from which arose a continual murmur of activity. The desire to mingle with men impelled him to enter the city, but the gross and beastly expression of their faces, the noise of their industries, and the indifference of their remarks, chilled his very heart. On holidays, when the cathedral bells rang out at daybreak, and filled the people's hearts with gladness, 
he watched the inhabitants coming out of their dwellings, the dancers in the public squares, the fountains of ale, the damask hangings spread before the houses of princes, and then, when night came, he would peer through the windows at the long tables where families gathered, and where grandparents held little children on their knees. Then sobs would rise in his throat, and he would turn away and go back to his haunts. He gazed with yearning at the colts in the pastures, the birds in their nests, the insects on the flowers, but they all fled from him at his approach, and hid or flew away. So he sought solitude, but the wind brought to his ears sounds resembling death rattles. The tears of the dew reminded him of heavier drops, and every evening the sun would spread blood in the sky, and every night in his dreams he lived over his parricide. He made himself a haircloth lined with iron spikes. On his knees he ascended every hill that was crowned with a chapel. But the unrelenting thought spoiled the splendor of the tabernacles and tortured him in the midst of his penances. He did not rebel against God, who had inflicted his action, but he despaired at the thought that he had committed it. He had such a horror of himself that he took all sorts of risks. He rescued paralytics from fire and children from waves, but the ocean scorned him and the flames spared him. Time did not allay his torment, which became so intolerable that he resolved to die. One day, while he was stooping over a fountain to judge of its depth, an old man appeared on the other side. He wore a white beard, and his appearance was so lamentable that Julian could not keep back his tears. The old man also was weeping. Without recognizing him, Julian remembered confusedly a face that resembled his. He uttered a cry, for it was his father who stood before him, and he gave up all thought of taking his own life. Thus weighted down by his recollections, he travelled through many countries and arrived at a river which was dangerous because of its violence and the slime that covered its shores, since a long time nobody had ventured to cross it. The bow of an old boat, whose stern was buried in the mud, showed among the reeds. Julian, on examining it closely, found a pair of oars, and hit upon the idea of devoting his life to the service of his fellow men. He began by establishing on the bank of the river a sort of road which would enable people to approach the edge of the stream. He broke his nails in his efforts to lift enormous stones which he pressed against the pit of his stomach in order to transport them from one point to another. He slipped in the mud, he sank into it, and several times was on the very brink of death. Then he took to repairing the boat with debris of vessels, and afterwards built himself a hut with putty and trunks of trees. When it became known that a ferry had been established, passengers flocked to it. They hailed him from the opposite side by waving flags, and Julian would jump into the boat and row over. The craft was very heavy, and the people loaded it with all sorts of baggage and beasts of burden, who reared with fright, thereby adding greatly to the confusion. He asked nothing for his trouble. Some gave him leftover victuals which they took from their sacks, or worn-out garments which they could no longer use. The brutal ones hurled curses at him, and when he rebuked them gently, they replied with insults, and he was content to bless them. A little table, a stool, a bed made of dead leaves, and three earthen bowls were all he possessed. Two holes in the wall served as windows. On one side, as far as the eye could see, stretched barren wastes, studded here and there with pools of water. And in front of him, 
flowed the greenish waters of the wide river. In the spring, a putrid odour arose from the damp sod. Then fierce gales lifted clouds of dust that blew everywhere, even settling in the water and in one's mouth. A little later, swarms of mosquitoes appeared, whose buzzing and stinging continued night and day. After that came frightful frosts which communicated a stone-like rigidity to everything and inspired one with an insane desire for meat. Months passed when Julian never saw a human being. He often closed his lids and endeavoured to recall his youth. He beheld the courtyard of a castle, with greyhounds stretched out on a terrace, an armoury filled with valets, and under a bower of vines, a youth with blonde curls, sitting between an old man wrapped in furs and a lady with a high cap. Presently the corpses rose before him, and then he would throw himself face downward on his cot and sob, Oh, poor father, poor mother, poor mother, and would drop into a fitful slumber in which the terrible visions recurred. One night he thought that someone was calling to him in his sleep. He listened intently, but could hear nothing save the roaring of the waters. But the same voice repeated, Julian! It proceeded from the opposite shore, fact which appeared extraordinary to him, considering the breadth of the river. The voice called a third time, Julian! and the high-pitched tones sounded like the ringing of a church bell. Having lighted his lantern, he stepped out of his cabin. A frightful storm raged. The darkness was complete, and was illuminated here and there only by the white waves leaping and tumbling. After a moment's hesitation, he untied the rope. The water presently grew smooth, and the boat glided easily to the opposite shore, where a man was waiting. He was wrapped in a torn piece of linen. His face was like a chalk mask, and his eyes were redder than glowing coals. When Julian held up his lantern, he noticed that the stranger was covered with hideous sores. But notwithstanding this, there was in his attitude something like the majesty of a king. As soon as he stepped into the boat, it sank deep into the water, borne downward by his weight. Then it rose again, and Julian began to row. With each stroke of the oars, the force of the waves raised the bow of the boat. The water, which was blacker than ink, ran furiously along the sides. It formed abysses and then mountains over which the boat glided. Then it fell into yawning depths where, buffeted by the wind, it whirled around and around. Julian leaned far forward and, bracing himself with his feet, bent backwards so as to bring his whole strength into play. Hailstones cut his hands, the rain ran down his back, the velocity of the wind suffocated him. He stopped rowing and let the boat drift with the tide, but realising that an important matter was at stake, a command which could not be disregarded, he picked up the oars again, and the rattling of the tholes mingled with the clamourings of the storm. The little lantern burned in front of him, Sometimes birds fluttered past it and obscured the light, but he could distinguish the eyes of the leper who stood at the stern as motionless as a column. And the trip lasted a long, long time. When they reached the hut, Julian closed the door and saw the man sit down on the stool. The species of shroud that was wrapped around him had fallen below his loins, and his shoulders and chest and lean arms were hidden under blotches of scaly pustules. Enormous wrinkles crossed his forehead. 
Like a skeleton, he had a hole instead of a nose, and from his bluish lips came breath which was fetid and as thick as mist. I am hungry, he said. Julian set before him what he had, a piece of pork and some crusts of coarse bread. After he had devoured them, the table, the bowl, and the handle of the knife bore the same scales that covered his body. Then he said, I thirst. Julian fetched his jug of water, and when he lifted it, he smelled an aroma that dilated his nostrils and filled his heart with gladness. It was wine. What a boon! But the leper stretched out his arm and emptied the jug at one draught. Then he said, I am cold. Julian ignited a bundle of ferns that lay in the middle of the hut. The leper approached the fire, and, resting on his heels, began to warm himself. His whole frame shook, and he was failing visibly. His eyes grew dull, his sores began to break, and in a faint voice he whispered, Thy bed! Julian helped him gently to it and even laid the sail of his boat over him to keep him warm. The leper tossed and moaned. The corners of his mouth were drawn up over his teeth. An accelerated death-rattle shook his chest, and with each one of his aspirations his stomach touched his spine. At last he closed his eyes. I feel as if ice were in my bones. Lay thyself beside me, he commanded. Julian took off his garments, and then, as naked as on the day he was born, he got into the bed. Against his thigh he could feel the skin of the leper, and it was colder than a serpent and as rough as a file. He tried to encourage the leper, but he only whispered, Oh, I am about to die. Come closer to me and warm me, not with thy hands, no, with thy whole body. So Julian stretched himself out upon the leper, lay on him, lips to lips, chest to chest. Then the leper clasped him close, and presently his eyes shone like stars. His hair lengthened into sunbeams. The breath of his nostrils had the scent of roses. A cloud of incense rose from the hearth, and the waters began to murmur harmoniously. An abundance of bliss, a superhuman joy, filled the soul of the swooning Julian, while he who clasped him to his breast grew and grew until his head and his feet touched the opposite walls of the cabin. The roof flew up in the air, disclosing the heavens, and Julian ascended into infinity, face to face with our Lord Jesus Christ, who bore him straight to heaven. And this is the story of St. Julian the Hospitaller, as it is given on the stained glass window of a church in my birthplace. End of St. Julian the Hospitaller